Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us on this session. We're going to be talking about things about the future of APMs, alternative payment methods. And I had a lovely script ready before we did a prep yesterday. And then somebody suggested, Isabel, that we should really put the, set the scene of what is an APM these days. And I love that question. So I'm going to jump straight in after I've done a few introductions. And today we've got with us uh, Tim Heath. Hi, Tim, founder and CEO of well, Coin hi. Gaming. Uh, we've got Isabel, who's global head of payments at Pinnacle. Hey, hey. Leo hey. Segal, who's director of payments at Stars Group. How are you doing? I'm good. And Vasily, at the director of gaming at Trustly. You there Hello. with us? Yeah, there you are. Great. So let's go straight into that that question, which I think is a brilliant question. And we're going to set the scene between us or between yourselves. What is an APM these days? And Isabel, you're going to go first because you set the question. I love it. Go ahead. <laughs> well, basically, it was just to find out when I started in the industry, an APM was anything that wasn't credit cards. And when I'm speaking to salesmen and everything else, it's still kind of that. But those aren't our alternative methods anymore. Those are the... the the meat and potatoes that's where most of the volume comes in that's where so much of it happens they're, they're not alternative they're just not credit card or not debit card not card scheme mm. um and uh it was interesting when I, I saw this panel that was the part that made me excited about joining it was because i wanted to find out what everybody thought about what really qualifies as an alternative payment method versus what is the old school definition and it seems that now the alternative payment method is just more like, well, crypto versus what it used to be. So I, I don't have an answer. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, so, okay. Um, if we move through, well, Vasily, well, what would you say? Well, in, in my view, I mean, the alternative payment method should be payment methods that are uh, maybe not commonly used in a market so there are there are those traditional payment methods like cards and even even wallets uh, and in specific markets those are the most used ones so the alternatives would be any payment methods that uh, provide an alternative to the traditional ones that are in a way disrupting the way people pay in a certain market so that would be my definition okay i'm going to move to lior What's your view? What is an APM? Uh, yeah, I will, I will take it further, I think. I think that uh, moving forward, credit and debit card will become the alternative payment solution. And I think that Isabel was, was pretty right. I think that the, the transition that we see on today on, on technology and access to payment solution and open banking and the way that we are using uh, you know, the technology to pay for things and, and you know the, the approach that Amazon make, for example, I think that alternative payment solution will become the new payments uh, and the new traditional ones. Even the, if you look at the Apple Pay and Google Pay of today, they are using the old rails, all, maybe for credit and debit cards, but they are going to to transfer the, the alternative payment solution. And there are, as, as Isabel said, there are markets, and there is, you know, alternative payment solution would be credit and debit card. Everybody is using other payment method. You look at what's going on in Africa, what's going on in, in, in Latin America, credit and debit card would be the, 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 the payment solution of, 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 of the old world and, and not the new one. Would you call a wallet an alternative payment method, Leo? Not, not really today. I think that, that everybody today has some kind of a wallet that he is using. If it's on, uh, on a specific merchant, on a specific platform, uh, but uh, it's not really alternative. It's it's the main payment solution we are using today. I don't carry a credit card or plastic in my pocket. To, and I don't I don't really need it to pay for things. So it's not alternative anymore. It's it's the main main payment solution we are using. Okay, thank you. Uh, good strong view. Would would expect nothing less from you, Leo. Tim. <laughs> let's bring in your view yeah. here. <laughs> Look, I think just from what Leo said, it's good to see that a, a technology built in the 1960s finally is being considered an alternative payment method. Um, but my perspective is more horizontal. And in some markets, 
what may be considered alternative becomes primary. So take Japan, for instance, we're finding that crypto is your primary method and your bank payments and credit cards are your alternative methods. However, that might be very different in Europe where your open banking is certainly changing the way things are working and then your wallets in some other regions and your boletos in Brazil is your primary. So your alternative is it's very different per jurisdiction uh, through the globalisation that's changing the way we're looking at payments. I'm getting the feeling that uh, this is no longer the um, future of alternative payments methods. This is the future of payments, excluding the card schemes. That's what you've all just said. Not that the card schemes have been excluded from payments. It's just, but that was a really good, good insight. And, I, and, and uh, although I'm not supposed to have a view, I agree with you guys. And I, I work in the APM bit, so. But moving through then, if we're defining that APMs are the norm needed and um, growing and meeting the needs of our customers more, let's think about the, the question of um, now that we've defined them, what makes any of the APMs, you can choose whichever one you want, what, what makes them smart and what, what is their future? And Lior, if it's okay, I'd like to start with you on there because you're cross-referencing a, a number of them where you are at the STARS group and you've got different different countries and local payments, et cetera. What, what, what's your view? What makes a, an APM smart? I think, I think that again, I think that I agree with you. I think that the challenge that we are facing in different, uh, in different market is, is not trivial. We see uh, specific, specifically in gaming. Gaming basically bring another challenge to uh, payment processing. It's not a traditional market in, in, many, in many cases. You need to find some alternative and some uh, an additional mix of payments to support a, a specific market. Uh, as, as Tim mentioned, for example, Brazil, um, Latin America is a very good example of, of supporting different payment solutions for different segments of your users. Uh, and a smart alternative would basically mean that it will make the journey much, much easier for the, for the user. If I need to go through a, a long process of authorization and, and, and confirmation and, and the KYC procedure, it will be a, a much more difficult way for, for me to engage with my users. And, and a smart way to do it would be make it seamless, make it easier. Don't, don't go, you know, don't break the, the regulation, but make sure that you can support a payment solution with all the hassle of processing in one, in one easy step, in one easy user journey. And it's not about the way that you're paying, it's, it's how comfortable you are with putting some information into a merchant account and, and process transaction very quickly. And don't, you know, it, payment is not the main thing, right? I want to purchase something, I just need the means to do it. And we are, you know, converting it to something very difficult to, to achieve. Let's make it simple. Let's make it straightforward. I know so much about the user as a gaming merchant. Let's make it, let, let's make it simple simple and, and convenient to the to the user uh, and, and this what makes a, an alternative payment solution successful in my view yeah no no I, I think it's a very strong point tim from from your side and being into the crypto side how would you respond to that yeah Are you finding you're well, able to make it simple <laughs> It's incredibly simple, and through the the, the, the adoption, the, the hardest thing is educating users about that. The first time you use Uber, you never you never don't you never call a taxi dispatch uh, telephone number again after you've used Uber the first time. We've found once players can onboard money through local payment methods into crypto, then the money can flow in and out of a gaming merchant incredibly seamlessly with no cost, no chargebacks, and no fraud. So for us, it's all about an education on how do we, how do we engage and integrate alternative payment methods, local payment methods to help people come into the crypto world, which is basically a digital uh, gaming chip, casino chip. It's a token of trust. So. The other side of the coin here is also from a merchant perspective, how easily you can reconcile your money out without being um, without being done under forex, and how you need to reconcile uh, seamlessly and quickly. Going back to the credit cards one, you've got the 180 days of rolling reserves and all this stuff. Actually, with some of these APMs, we don't have that worry anymore and it's a much more simpler process uh for for merchants to get their hands on that money to satisfy their needs 
Okay. Vasily, I know that you think that, uh, that from the traditional banks, actually the alternative payment systems have a future, even in the uh, traditional markets, like, and you were talking yesterday about the UK. Do you want to add in some comments through here? Yeah, I think to, to, to answer to this question, uh, I think that the future or what makes the APM smart is innovation, it's uh, speed, it's security, and it's also uh, helping solve the problems that both the consumers and the merchants uh, are dealing with today. I would agree with, with what uh, the previous panelists said, that uh, the payments need to be simple, they need to be seamless, but I would also add that they need to, uh, today it's not enough anymore uh, that payments are just helping to move the money from the user's bank account to the merchant's, uh, to the player account. That the payments or the alternative payment methods needs to become more than just payments and actually offer help to the merchants to uh, register or, or KYC their users uh, or uh, to the users to skip this uh, this uh, boring and long process of registration, authentication, providing different documents. I, I know that I'm pushing the conversation towards what Trustly is doing, but but I, I believe uh, really that that is the future of alternative payment methods being more than just payments and using technology technology to achieve that. But uh, w okay. when it comes to the UK, uh, to the UK, I think that uh, that I will talk more about that later in the, in, in yeah, some okay, of the next questions. Okay, because I know you got Not... some strong, yeah, you got <laughs> yeah, you got some strong views. Um, so Isabel, how how do you, as as the operator here, well, what's your response to all of that? Lior and I are holding hands and singing Kumbaya because. <laughs> It's very much the um, it's very much sort of the localization and and making the customer's experience seamless and and the difference is is that when you're talking to a supplier who is their business is in that market they are that market that is all they do they're dealing with customers who already know the product they already know how to move the money they have access to more local means of KYC. They understand how that works. In some cases, they've already KYC their customer because those customers are using those methods on a regular basis or they're connected to the banking system or, you know, in the case of Sweden with Trustly, you've got, you know, where they're connected to the, to the databases for KYC. So you can get it all over the world and you do tend to find that a local supplier and a local company already has that buy-in from their client base. and their knowledge of that market and how to make it seamless is already there, you know? So it's it's not as hard um, for us. It does, as you know, Basilic was saying, it takes a, a lot of the work and effort away from us once we've found the right local suppliers to come in and do that. The important thing is sometimes you do get local suppliers who feel that, well, this is my local product, I know it, so you need me. And it's like, well, yeah, but let's do this as partners and we'll do it together and you know me and you know it, it also works with having good partners you know? yeah so sharing the knowledge so if it's local that's great but your business is your business sharing yeah. gets it right yeah yeah absolutely absolutely and helping us understand i, 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 would like... I, I don't know every geo specific area in the world so having help from the from the companies that i'm partnering with that do know their area um, you know, it's in, uh, I ask a lot of questions. Ask anybody who works with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good thing. Uh, Vasily, you're about to say something, I think. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to to actually uh, to to ask a question myself. I think that, or or to make a statement. I think that uh, local localization or using local providers is extremely important because obviously they have the knowledge of the market, they have the the brand brand recognition. But but my view is also that that the alternative payment method, especially the ones that bring innovative uh, approach to to doing payments, could be actually used to to. Uh, in changing the customer behavior. So both merchants and payment providers entering specific markets in order to uh, maybe help uh, the users understand that these new technologies are going to simplify the way they pay. And that's very hard to achieve. Obviously, there are very uh, like strong 
views or, or, or habits of the users in specific markets that, that were maybe thought impossible to change. But uh, I think that with new, new technologies and with this uh, kind of open-minded approach uh, from the operators and payment providers that, that actually at the APMs could be used to help uh, change the behavior of the users. In a but I think way, on obviously. that point, Vasily, you're right. Now, if I, if I look at the Brazilian example again, Boleto has been the standard for X number of years in Brazil and doing your advanced exactly. Boleto where you're pre-screening a customer. In November, comes out PIN payments, which is basically set for instant in Brazil. Now, that's going to change the whole market. So potentially, as technology grows in local jurisdictions, the mindset and the, the, the what the, the local country is doing changes the way we need to to work with different payment methods on a, on a local basis there because pin payments is going to change the whole way that all of brazil works and it's going to make it cheaper faster more efficient and better reconciliations i couldn't agree more that's actually what happened in, in sweden with with uh, i'm going to use trust as an example again our founders were actually uh, involved in, in a gaming company and and uh, uh, basically, they identified the need for instant payouts, and nobody was paying instant payouts then. Now, if you don't have instant payouts in Sweden or Finland, you know you are in a big disadvantage compared to your competitors. And then even the the, the pay and play technology registration through a deposit with the KYC data provided by the payment provider is something that is an industry standard now in, in specific markets. So, so these are all examples of how how technology or or new ideas are changing the behavior of the whole market. And I think that that is also the future. And, and there will be more exciting things to come from, from different areas of the world, uh, depending on, on what the companies that operate there bring. Good debate. Leo, did you want to add anything in before we get to the next question? Or? No, I, I will wait. I will wait. I, I have some, some, <laughs> some new views, but I will wait. OK. OK. So let's move on to a different question, which Everything is really evolving through. Um, do you think that we can get the traditional payment providers, which I'm using that terminology before we started to define who everybody was, so I'm going into old school language, uh, the card schemes and the banks, to get a grip and engage and work together? Do you see a bank accepting alternative payment methods as a loading? There's some banks beginning to get involved in crypto, but not necessarily in our area, in our, et cetera? Or are they going to lose out? Feel free to say what you want to be able to say. And I'm going to start with you, Vasily, because you're working with the, with the banks, with the Trustly model. What is your view on that? Well, I think that, that uh, it's, the change is inevitable. Uh, with the PSD2, the banks are opening their APIs to the, to the companies uh, that will uh, be using those APIs to create solutions similar to Trustly that are offering payments, but not only payments, other uh, uh, supporting services for authentication, identification. And I think that already the banks are changing. I mean, if you take uh, the specific markets in Europe that had the outdated banking infrastructure, they, they were some of the markets, such as UK, were very quick to implement uh, the new APIs and uh, to introduce the new authentication methods like uh, fingerprint or face authentication, or the, the, to update their apps. All of these activities and actions are improvements and, and changes that are going to bring better user experience, regardless of a payment method that will be using this technology to pay. So I think that, uh, that inevitably, uh, banks and traditional payment methods are moving in the direction of innovation, because that's the only way to survive, I believe. But see, if you look at China, and it's not necessarily, I'm sorry, it's not necessarily no, from a gaming perspective, but 91% of all payments are done on Alipay and WeChat. They've bypassed that whole banking revolution, which Europe is now sort of going through. So potentially looking at making payments with QR codes, which are irreversible, will become the norm in five, 10 years' time once we can get over the speed hump of redundant technology. I think also going with that, you're. you're it's a lovely, and I kind of always argue, the lovely example of the European situation. Europe's banking is unique. The rest of the world is not on the same level. The, left, the rest of the world, you still have, in the United States, you still have individually owned local banks, you know, mom and, you know, mom and dad's bank in this little town here, and the other one, several of them are not linked. You still have to go through, you know, everything is, is, 
is still extremely antiquated and they're still relying on software that I think was built in the 1940s even. Um, and don't quote me on that date. <laughs> Even the idea of reliant on software, yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, they're, they're still writing things down on paper and using pen, and, and exactly. And that's across the board. That's that's not only in um, in, in the U.S., that's, that's in a lot of countries, in most countries. Um, it's interesting, though, because I do think that they're going to have to start to see how that's going to work, because you do have also in those same countries the the – the unbanked, the not, the alternatives such as crypto and and sort of the the payment options that are removing themselves from the banking infrastructure, um, and it'll be an interesting thing to see if, as you say, Tim, that the banks actually keep up because if they don't keep up, they yeah, their value will go down significantly, um, and so it'll be an interesting thing on a global scale. I do agree. I would love them to take sort of the European model because it is really, really good and easy for customers. But uh, that's not how it is in on a global scale. It makes It's why crypto is, is doing so well. Yeah. Um, you know, what is the line, what is the line you quote? As you fiat quote gets more line. difficult, crypto will take over. <laughs> yeah. We keep making it more difficult, yeah. Lior, so do you want to enter this debate? Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. I think that the, the, the old banking uh, world is, is not existing anymore and, and won't exist in, in the very near future, I think. It, it will come faster. I think the, the COVID-19 um, experience that we have right now really push us through, uh, again, non-banking solution or... You know the, the the need for a banking partner for holding my funds or, or processing my, my 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 payments is is no longer that valid, and and and, and you know if, if cash was the cryptocurrency of the old days, I think that the new age will bring some different crypto and different uh, uh, technology that basically replace cash and an old banking system. And if you, they won't cope, and you can see the the challenging challenger banking system that pops in. in Everywhere, they 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 won't be there. I don't I don't really think that my kids will ever step into a a, a banking branch or talk to a clerk uh, in a physical uh, um, place. So everything is going to be to change, and and the access to my funds will no will no longer will require the old banking system. But I think if I step forward from a crypto perspective there, if we start looking at sort of non-custodial to centralised wallets where money is split up across different different entities, having that non-custodial perspective allows people to feel the comfort that my money is not locked in a bank and I can't get it without sending 14 invoices in to try and satisfy a payment there. The issue I've got, we're trying to solve with crypto, is how do we take away the volatility and make people their first uh, iteration with crypto, how to make that a comfortable feeling. And maybe that's using stable coins or using some kind of digital representation just to remove that barrier to entry, the scaredness of people. Because banks don't like it because I don't think they understand it and they realise it's going to take over what they're doing as a, as a viable alternative. Uh I used, I was going to say, I used to work well, on Isabel, please, please say. No, I've, I've always argued that the, 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 the problem with crypto is that when it first came out, everybody dealing in crypto wanted to make it sound like it was so much more than it was. It was all this and it's this and it's this and it's this. And they made it into this daunting, terrifying thing that you felt that if you didn't understand it, that that was okay because nobody else understood it. When actually it, it wasn't that complicated and it wasn't that intense. And that's actually been really bad for crypto as a as a on a whole because there's a lot of people who are scared of it because of the people who loved it so much at the beginning overcomplicating it. <laughs> I've always when I first got into it, I, I couldn't understand it. And then when I did sort of realize that you just strip all the layers away and it's a very simple thing, that's when I was comfortable with it. But so many people are like, oh, you know so much. I'm like, no. I just stopped overcomplicating it. And the banks and the um, compliance and regulators don't have that. Yeah. We just had a, a, a really good comment. The value taken between two untrusted parties. <laughs> yeah. 
So, guys, we've just had an interesting comment from Charlie from um, Hypay, who's basically saying they're really enjoying the the, the conversation. Um, and it, it's in line with what something I was about to say. So the, the places are emerging and people have to, in, in the banking and uh, different payment methods, start to collaborate and start to work. And I couldn't agree more. From a history point of view, we talked about this, I think, um, before, especially as well. I think you and I have had this conversation. I used to be in digital imaging and I witnessed uh, the most amazing brand think they were bigger than the digital revolution of digital imaging and Kodak was the company and, and sat back. I'd hate to think some of the big payment brands that have a lot of experience and a lot of support that they could be bringing um, lose out into the digital payment world. Um, I can see a lot of work going on, but that's the point that uh, Charlie's making from um, high pay. And I agree with you that uh, collaboration and working together is a key thing for everybody. And uh, if there's any more questions, guys, please post them and I'll try and catch them as we're going. Um, so, if we take that a little bit further, what is the most exciting future for any of the APM, APMs around the world? Um, Tim, I'm going to start with you, if I may. Something well, is exciting in the future. That's okay. I, you can be biased here. I, I put a Bitcoin logo on on Watford's sleeve last Premier League, uh, the English Premier League season. So my, I certainly see the future in, um, in crypto, mainly because... Um, Banking is so difficult these days that all of a sudden, if you can create an ecosystem of money flying around, paying your suppliers, getting your deposits, and it's all being done with crypto, life becomes much, much easier because it's programmatic. Um, but I, I'm especially enjoying the challenge of t going to some, let's call it less bank countries, and trying to find local payment methods, building a layer using the Lightning Network and providing, making crypto easy for the end user, because at the end of the day, they want to go and play the slot game. They don't want to have to muck around doing a difficult payment method. How do we make that easy? And that's what we're looking to try and build at the moment, which is, um, which is a very exciting journey and good adventure. So looking forward to doing that. Okay, okay, cool, thank you. Vasile, what do you where, we, where would you be here? Excitement and APMs of the future. This is if I'm writing a script I mean, for a movie. Uh, what would you, where would you be? <laughs> I think the future looks bright. I think that there will be a lot of opportunities for, for the APMs to use the new technologies in order to improve their products, features, and functionalities. I think that, uh, that uh, when, when it comes to, to bank payments, something that Trustly offers, there is, a, there is the open banking initiative, the PSD2, uh, that is opening a lot of capabilities for, for improvements. And uh, there will be other initiatives. Uh, I think that uh, to the point that Isabel made previously, I think that there is a lot, there is uh, several markets across the world where, where we can uh, bring this type of payments to the con closer to the consumers, because inevitably things are changing. Now in the US, uh, even Isabel, if you're interested, Trustly is offering bank payments in the US through Pay With My Bank. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, but, uh, but then, th then even in Brazil now, uh, uh, I'm sure you're aware of, of the open banking initiatives. And, and I believe that that trend, uh, when it comes to this type of payments, will continue. And then the new technologies uh, will help offer again i'm coming back to the same uh, point i made before where the payment providers will not offer just payments but more than that they will help uh, create a seamless experience for the user uh, regardless of whether that is gaming or, or e-commerce or, 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 or financial services uh, and i think that uh, that uh, the new technologies and the innovation uh, is making the future exciting definitely for us at trusted thank you i'm going to pass this through to isabel and and, and leo but if we add into that, um, there's always going to be multiple payments require requirements, no matter where you are. So from an exciting point of view and the future, do you see that as continuing? Do you see no matter what country you're in, you're going to have multiple people to provide a service to? I see it not only as a, as a, as a reality, I, I actually see it happening more and more. Um, you're going to have some areas like Europe where it's going to just become more and more sort of one big route and you just do that and everybody does the same thing. Um, but when you look at sort of the unbanked becoming 
maybe not traditionally banked, but banked and developing nations and sort of just general globalization, each of those countries has already got what their is their norms. They've got their traditions. They've got things that work for them. Um, and I don't see that that's going to change in the same direction each time because people have different cultures and different layers of importance. Things that one country values as sacred, other countries, people are like, oh, that's fine, you can have all that information, we don't mind. Um, and so for me, actually, the future is very, very much a broader span, much more working with smaller solutions that are more geospecific and cater to their market, but do it well and do it easily. And so it, it will be that they will uniquely get better at what they do because they will learn from other markets. But I don't see as a whole that it's all going to be one umbrella. I think there's going to be several different umbrellas and hopefully they'll just be able to sort of learn from each other what works and what doesn't work. Um, but it has to be to the market that they're catering for. Um, you yeah, look at Canada. Different you look at, yeah, you look at Canada and you yeah. look at, at Europe, and they they're both have extremely advanced systems. They're just completely different. So, well, <laughs> extremely advanced is a little bit generous, but. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you mean Canada or Europe on that. <laughs> yes, <sure. laughs> just, just general, just general. Leo, from your side, do you have hopes and excitement about the future? Yeah, I will try to spice it a little bit. I Go. think that 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 Isabel and and and, my, and, our, and us is the future of alternative payment solution. I think that <clears throat> think of what we are doing. We basically process funds on a daily basis for for our customers in and out and you know practically we are a bank we are a payment solution we're holding a massive volume on behalf of our clients maybe on a gaming license not a financial license but but for us as a technology company to build a financial platform that support it or move funds in and out from a gaming account to a financial account we can easily become, I wouldn't say easily, sorry, I would have drawn that, but we can become a financial institution if we want to. And it's, it's, Leo, it's more about yeah. the appetite and, and think about cryptocurrency, Tim. For us to, to convert the, the chips and pins to a cryptocurrency or a token, for, if you want, it's something that can be done. And I, I can see in the future merchants becoming a financial institution because of the strength of the brand in local options, in international ability to process funds in and out. Think about the schemes and the structure that we are holding in house today, convert it to, convert it to a financial platform is not that far-fetched. So to go right. further, we've just, been, we've just invested into two banks and we've got a goal to have a bank in Africa, South America, Europe, UK and the Philippines. And we're doing exactly that to control our on and off ramps because you're 100% spot on and then you have your digital hawala. So one account anywhere in the world, all currencies and we control the ecosystem ourselves. So I'm happy to take PokerStars as my first client in our banking network. <laughs> Thank you, Leo. <laughs> 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 hey. Isabella Pinnacle will be second. And <laughs> I, I want to know what's the future of cash? And Andrea, I think you might be well placed to answer this one because uh, where is cash in the whole situation here? If I had a Bitcoin, piece of a Bitcoin for everybody that asks me, is cash dead? It ain't dead, guys. And never should it be because at the minute you push things underground, it goes in the wrong way. Cash is not dead. And I'm talking Europe. When you go into certain other countries like Africa, then naturally cash is not dead. And just because everybody's got a, a wallet doesn't mean to say that everybody has a wallet that they can use. They still have wallets that groups of people operate with one individual with the wallet. Cash is not dead. Cash needs to be traceable and that cash needs to be controlled. And in the US, cash is going to be seriously um, important. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting. and, and uh, it, if the banks, let's say a future was that cash is gone, they'll find something else that they call cash. And I don't mean digital because mm -hmm. it'll be something else that we tried. Um, but yeah, thanks for asking. <laughs> That's good, good, good for asking. Thank you. Um, I just know in the, Asian, gonna... the Asian markets, cash is still important there as well, especially oh, with the yeah. agents. 
Yeah. I do believe, I, I, obviously it's it's close to my heart, but I do believe that, that it needs to be done and allowed to happen, but in a controlled way. Um, mm -hmm. I am getting a few questions in, but I'm going to carry on here because your debate and conversation is, is, is flowing really nice. I'll try and catch up with those questions, guys. Um, and if Stan is listening, hi, Stan. Um, the concept of the payments, how many... On average, and I am talking international, how many payment methods do we need in our market, in the gambling market? So, um, start with you, Tim. You're there. How many? I, I, I remember reading a piece by the guy who did um, Wikipedia, and he said you should not have more than four or five payment methods per person because even any more than that and you'll confuse the clients and they won't close the do the checkout in the shopping cart so the future is on a personalized jurisdictional basis give them the five or the four or five most appropriate ones and that's it and personalize the experience for the customer but good luck because it's a difficult process <laughs> to do it <laughs> yeah, i know isabel what's your response to that well, um, I'll admit that during the practice session, I think I learned more than I than I knew. Um, so I I was very happy with this question because I'm learning from you guys. Um, I think that four or five in some markets is absolutely fine as long as you target the right ones. Um, I think you have a little bit with us. You, you have some industry. Um, older solutions within the industry that you just have to keep and whether or not they count in your 405 might limit you you know quite a bit so i would go depending on the market and depending on the ease of movement of funds a little bit higher than that but i do think that you have to be careful um to not intimidate your customer by having too much choice um i, I don't have a number because i think it does depend very much on the market and you've got to work closely with your country managers. You've got to work closely with your local suppliers, learn from it, do market research, do competitive analysis, see what's out there and, and who's got what. Um, I'm, I'm currently doing a little bit of an experiment myself where I have probably a, you know, um, a few more than I would like in, in some markets just to see which ones are actually getting volume. And it, it was something that I could do at the time and then I may or may not offer those um, going forward when we have our new cashier, or I may turn around and say like, okay, let's let's figure out how we can accommodate these because they all have value. Um, and that's really the, the interesting thing is yeah. what's the value in each one. So Vasily and um, Leo, uh, do, do you have an input on that? Didn't mean to cut you off, Isabel, sorry. No, no, no. Sure, Leo, I think again, I think that the right right approach would be a hybrid approach. Uh, you know, there, there will be markets that you will need more than four or five parent solution, but I think that the way to control it is to profile your users and understand exactly what you need to offer them. And uh, there are different different type of payment solution that you can offer. And once you identify the the let's say the relevant one per segment of users, you can you can you can minimize the the offering. You don't need to push them push 20 different payment solution for a single user if you understand from other parameters what he is more likely to use. So I think that if you understand the market, understand the, the parameters of users that you are uh, offering your service to, you will be able to uh, mitigate it. And, and again, depend on the, on the journey of the user as well. At the beginning, you may be offering more than one payment option. Once you get to know him, know. You, will, you, you will reduce it, obviously. Vasily, we've got a couple of minutes left. Do you, what, yeah. What's your quick answer? I, I, I think it's a very interesting question. And actually, in my view, it depends on the strategy of, of an operator. Because uh, I think that it, a lot has to do with what Leo said, the profiling of the users. But uh, I also think that the approach towards uh, the, the whole business strategy uh, will influence the payment methods. And by that, I mean uh, you have the your household brands that are uh, uh, live in different markets and obviously there you need to have uh, local payment methods and some of the traditional payment methods that are always there but then you also have some stripped down versions of small brands that are available only in uh, single markets and uh, uh, i mean again from my experience at trustly we have created their, that revolution in the in in sweden finland and some other markets in europe where you have the the 
multiple brands, more than 120 yeah. brands that have only one payment method, one registration method, one payment method. Uh, and, and it's a smooth and seamless way of doing business. Obviously, you cannot do that on, on okay. your PokerStars brand or Pinnacle. Uh, it, it is uh, difficult, but you can do it on small brands. Okay, I'm gonna, we've now literally got uh, 15 seconds, so I'm going to say thank you to everybody and just give a quick summary of what I think I've heard today, which has been really exciting and really enjoyed it. Thank you. I think they know your customer has changed to know how your customer is going to pay. And know, getting the local knowledge is important. Not everything fits everything. An alternative payment method is really going to be the payment methods and choosing the right ones. And sharing knowledge and getting getting a sharing of, of knowledge across the board is, is really important. I do think the future APMs is an exciting future, but it's getting it right and getting the mix right. And I think working together and things like this, talking across together has really, really helped. I'd like to thank all of you. Uh, I'd like to thank the um, audience for putting in some q and A. I I know that we haven't answered everything. Uh, it's been a good session. Thank you. Take care. Thanks a lot, video, I hope Brilliant. now. Thank yeah, you, thank man. you. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.